Uh, just start off by introducing myself. My name is uh, Chris Savick. I'm one of the archaeologists here and uh, director of the Artifact Conservation Lab. And today I'm going to talk about uh, our ongoing search for uh, the site of McDonough Shipyard right here in Virgins. Um, I should start off by saying that I'm a very casual presenter. If you have questions as I speak, feel free to raise your hand. We can have a more formalized uh, question and answer session at the end, but I, I don't mind the, the occasional interruption anyway. Um, and I should also say that I am a, I'm a nautical archaeologist, so this is a kind of the new world for me, dealing with dirt and pits and things like that. So bear with me as I, as I cruise along here. Um, and, and, you know, we'll start off, as you should, with a little bit of historic background here. Of course, the, the causes for the War of 1812 are many and varied, but the, the most commonly uh, given are, you know, uh, free trade and sailors' rights. Um, in, in the years leading up to the War of 1812, um, American merchant shipping was, was absolutely booming. It was um, extremely large and uh, really taking advantage of the war between the British and the French. Um, you know, that whole Napoleonic War era really led to a good uh, commercial boom for U.S. shipping, which meant that the shippers in America attracted a lot of really good sailors. And the British, needing as many sailors as they could for this war, decided to, that they could just take those sailors when they wanted to. So they would stop American vessels and impress seamen right off of the vessel, claiming that they were British sailors who would, you know, had, had become traders and gone to America. And uh, there's probably some that were and many that weren't. And either way, it, it really made a lot of people in the States very angry. Um, you know, the British reasons um, for the war are also very complicated. Uh, you know, in, in, some, in some cases, I think they wanted to recapture the colonies. Uh, there was a big push to stop the westward expansion of the, of the Americans. Um, therefore maintaining the, the, the fur trade that was going on into the far west. Lots of different reasons for the War of 1812, and really not, not the subject of this, converse, uh, of this discussion, but we'll go on from there. The war was actually uh, officially declared on the American side on June 18th of 1812. And, you know, thinking about the uh, way communications worked at this time, many people on the frontier didn't find out about that, that the country was at war for at least a month. Um, so these things, these things took a while at the time, but it was June of 1812 when things started to kick off. And right away, things started happening mostly on the northern frontier. Um, the, uh, the British uh, on the frontier actually found out about the war before the Americans did. So they managed to swoop down and, and take the fort at Michilmackinac. Um, they re repulsed uh, an American attack on uh, the, trying to cross the river at Detroit. And there was a number of actions on the Niagara Peninsula. Things really got heated up pretty quick um, along the Great Lakes and, and the corridor there. Uh, and pretty quickly, you know, people realized the importance of Lake Champlain in this battle, just in, in this ongoing war, just like they did during the Revolution and, and, and wars before that. So as you can see, the way that Lake Champlain is oriented in conjunction with the Richelieu River to the north, Lake George and the Hudson River to the south, you have an almost continuous water route uh, from Canada to New York City. And though it doesn't seem that important today, you know, in, in the early 19th century, this was a, a basically a trackless wilderness. You, you could not easily move large quantities of men and material through this area without using the lakes and rivers. So control of those lakes and rivers was extremely important. Um, and the Americans quickly, you know, realized strate the strategic importance of this and, and sent a few people, at least, to, to man some garrisons in and around Lake Champlain. Uh, the naval forces on Lake Champlain at this time consisted of two gunboats that were really there to stop smugglers, one of which was actually sunk and rotten, and the other one was uh, in pretty poor shape. Um, the local authorities quickly pressed several merchant ships into the military service, but it was a pretty basic fleet, rudimentary fleet for sure. Um, and, and, until uh, Thomas McDonough was sent, uh, sent along to, to try to put things in order. Um, McDonough was a very young man at the time of his appointment, uh, appointment, only 28 years old, but he was a veteran of the actions in Tripoli, where he had made a bit of a name for himself, so he uh, was given this commission. And uh, 
he, he went about rearming these merchant ships, trying to upgun them a little bit, make them a slightly more substantial fighting force. And, uh, you know, actions kind of seesawed back and forth on the lake. The Americans lost a couple vessels. Uh, they repelled a couple raids by, by British soldiers. Um, fortunately, one of the largest raids, Murray's Raid, which, ha which happened in the middle of uh, 1813, uh, about 1,400 British soldiers came down, you know, out of the Richelieu River and attacked several settlements uh, at the northern end of the lake, both in New York and Vermont. Um, the small flotilla that was transporting these troops actually engaged in a brief firefight with the battery that had been established in Burlington in what is now known as Battery Park. Um, and they managed to burn several uh, merchant vessels uh, during the course of this action. And it was in the winter of 1813 when uh, McDonough took what was left of the fleet, you know, what fleet he had, and he took it up the river, uh, up Otter Creek to Virgins for the winter. It was kind of a safe port, uh, hidden away from the main lake, and it was the site of numerous sawmills and ironworks, and it was a great place to start constructing a new fleet. Uh, the British were engaging in a fairly large boat building scheme up, uh, up in the northern end of the lake, and McDonough knew that he had to uh, put the spurs to it and, and make some vessels to contest the, uh, the lake uh, when the spring came. So they uh, set, up, set up shop somewhere on Otter Creek, which is kind of the whole point of our conversation here, and uh, frantically went to work um, producing ships at, a, at just an incredible rate. Um, during the summer of 1814, you know, the British, uh, realizing that the, this contest was, uh, was getting pretty, pretty heated up, they sent a small force to try to uh, at least blockade the end of Otter Creek, if not come up Otter Creek, and, and destroy the ongoing shipbuilding efforts. And this led to a brief encounter on May 14th of 1814, right at the mouth of the, uh, the river. Um, uh, at, at what became known as Fort Cass and named after the Navy lieutenant who was uh, manning one of the gun batteries there. Uh, the Americans managed to drive off the small British fleet um, with, with no major loss. And, there, and pretty shortly thereafter, McDonough took the fleet out of the river as quickly as he could, so it couldn't get bottled up there again. To give you an idea of, of the shipbuilding that was going on, um, when he took over the shipyard in Virgin's uh, in December of 1813, McDonough found a vessel on the stocks being built, and this was actually uh, was being built as a steamboat, would have been the, sep the second operational steamboat on Lake Champlain. He quickly took over that ship and converted it to the Ticonderoga, um, the remains of which are still in, in Whitehall today. And that was his first uh, you know, major ship that he was able to put, put into the water. Uh, also started uh, constructing a number of row galleys. These are just, well, these are, are pretty big rowboats, but uh, rowboats nonetheless. It's a big 74-foot long rowboat with a big gun in the bow. Um, the advantage here being that this boat could be easily maneuvered even against the wind, uh, something that had proved very important uh, during the Revolutionary War. And these were pretty much a staple of, of, war, of naval warfare um, in inland waters and in coastal waterways at this time. Uh, built, built a number of these. And then uh, started laying out some larger ships like the Saratoga, which was produced in only 40 days from tree to hull in 40 days. Uh, and if you have any knowledge of shipbuilding at all, that is absolutely insane. Um, typically wood is, is cut and seasoned for several years before it's even considered ready to be built to to use to build a ship so they were making things fast and furious they were cutting it milling it and putting it together as fast as they could they were not building these boats for the long term they were building these boats to get the job done uh, right now um, yeah as, as you can see here this quote from the sec secretary of navy william jones saying i see no end to this war of broad axes this is a comment not only on the, uh, the shipbuilding in Lake Champlain, but throughout the Great Lakes, we have this kind of arms race going on all over the place where everybody's building fleets, but nobody's actually fighting very much. Um, but in Lake Champlain, that was, uh, was to change before too long. 
Not to be outdone by the Saratoga, the Eagle is a slightly smaller vessel, but was built in only 19 days. So it's just, uh, I mean, they must have had these guys working 24-7 and, uh, and working hard. Now, getting the hull's launch was one thing. He, uh, McDonough had a really hard time finding the equipment to completely outfit the vessel and the men to, to work it. Uh, but by the middle of the summer, he was starting to feel pretty good about the fleet and, uh, and managed to get some of the boats out into the Broad Lake. Um, the Eagle has been uh, extensively studied archaeologically. We'll see some more of that in, uh, in the future here. These two fleets finally met in combat uh, at the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay in, on September 11th of 1814. And uh, a lot of attention is, is focused on the naval battle there, which is obviously what we're going to be talking about too. But it was, the larger, it was only a component of a larger invasion. There was a, a pretty substantial land force that was also assaulting the town of Plattsburgh and the areas around it. Um, but the two fleets met. Uh, they had about a two and a half hour slug match. And uh, uh, McDonough had, had, had picked his position very cleverly. He actually pulled in behind Cumberland Head I think I have a better map of it here, yeah, behind Cumberland Head and actually anchored his fleet uh, there behind that peninsula. He knew that this would force the British who were sailing, you know, from the north would have to wait for a southerly wind. They would have to come down and then as they rounded the point, they would have to fight their way up into the wind to come to grips with the American fleet. The American fleet's anchored. They're not worried about working their sails. They're worried about shooting their guns. And that was, that was good because... <laughs> Uh, they weren't, weren't the best gunners and, uh, or the best seamen, so they, he, he maximized uh, his force's capabilities by proper positioning. Um, the British fleet, you know, it does manage to get up and, and come to grips with the American fleet, but uh, it, it has to strike its colors after about two and a half hours of, of pretty intense battle. Um, there were a number of veterans of Trafalgar who were uh, involved in this conflict. And they, 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 the, the quote I remember is that Trafalgar was but a flea bite compared to the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay. The vessels were very close and the fighting was very intense. Um, after the battle, uh, the Americans you know, capture the whole British fleet and the uh, British land forces retreat to Canada. You know, the threat to, the, to Lake Champlain is, is pretty much uh, quelled for the rest of the war. This defeat was really uh, one of the things that pushed the British towards uh, starting to negotiate peace uh, in 1814. Um, a lot of archaeological remains have been found of the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay. Some of them right in Plattsburgh Bay itself, like this enormous anchor that was recovered in, uh, I think it was 1999, um, which we believe uh, fell off of the... British flagship, the Confiance, which is the largest sailing ship that has ever operated on Lake Champlain. It's a, a 36-gun frigate. This anchor is about 14 feet tall, and the, the cross piece is also about 14 and a half feet, and the total weight of this unit is about 3,200 pounds, so you know, a, a really enormous anchor. Um, remains of the vessels themselves mostly ended up at the very southern end of the lake. Uh, both the American fleet and the remains of the British fleet were taken down to Whitehall, taken up into the Pulteney River, which is one of the you know, major tributaries of Lake Champlain in that part of the lake. And they were laid up in ordinary, which means they had sheds built over them and they were just basically put into floating storage. Um, and there they sat and there they sat until they sunk. They, uh, you know, they weren't needed again and they just basically rotted away until they sank. And these have been um, examined on a number of occasions, uh, starting in the 1980s and uh, again in the mid-90s, groups from the Maritime Museum and its predecessors and from Texas A&M University uh, spent a lot of time working on these vessels, uh, including our, our museum founder, Art Cohn, and our good friend and colleague, Kevin Christman, who's a professor at uh, Texas A&M Texas A University. And, um, uh, you know, some really exciting uh, documentation and artifacts recovered from, from those sites. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we also have the remains of the Ticonderoga uh, that are still on display in Whitehall. It doesn't look like much there, but it's, it's still very impressive if you go and see it in person. It's, it was a very large vessel. Um, as, a, as a bit of a side note here, this summer we had uh, our first archaeological field school 
since the mid 90s. And uh, we actually took a group of six students um, and for the first week we were trying to kind of teaching them the the ins and outs of documenting a ship underwater and the best way to, to train them to do that was to take them to a shipwreck on land explore it measure it and things like that and then uh, and then the next week put, we put them into the water on an actual shipwreck and it was a, a wonderful learning laboratory and I think uh, you know working on the real thing is always better than working on a mocked up model but this picture is probably from the mid 80s but it still looks exactly like this <laughs> A lot more bird's nests built into it, though, unfortunately. All right, so that brings us to the question of the shipyard. Where is the shipyard? Where was the shipyard? Um, considering the importance of this uh, area and uh, the, the history around it, it's quite remarkable that we don't know exactly where it was. There's a number of places that, you know, have been identified as the shipyard and may or may not be. Um, so we, we set out to try to figure out where that was. And we got some uh, funding and support for this from the um, National Park Service Battlefield Protection uh, Grant. Gave us a small amount of money to go and actually do some test excavations to see if we could locate um, the, the shipyard site. Um, let's see, I don't know if this laser pointer works. You know, the, the commonly mentioned place is uh, it's typically right in this area if you're familiar with Virgenz at all, this is where the, the, the little seawall is now. There's often a, a bunch of boats there in the summer. Uh, there's actually a monument about the shipyard right there. That it, it doesn't really seem large enough uh, to have built these enormous vessels. So our research led us to, to look at this piece of, of land right down in here. Um, there's only so many places where you have a, a gradual enough slope of the shoreline that's flat and wide enough and long enough to build, you know, 200 foot long vessels. So that's what led us kind of into this area. Also, the fact that this area was a U.S. arsenal in the years after the War of 1812. You know, our, our supposition being that um, if it was a U.S. Navy shipyard during the war, perhaps that piece of property just stayed in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, service as another in another capacity uh, now through this area in the 1820s we have the construction of the towpath along otter creek and this was used uh, like a towpath on a canal to, to haul vessels up and down the the length of the river bringing them up to the virgins and, and then back down out to the lake so it goes right through the middle of our site uh, it was a u.s arsenal up into the 1870s um, when it became a, a reform school, a state-owned reform school, and operated in that capacity, uh, gosh, up into the 70s, I believe, um, and is now Northland's Job Corps. That's the, the site of Northland's Job Corps. Uh, so still, still state property. And let's give you a good idea of where, where we, we focused our attention, right in this area. So this is McDonough Drive, if you're familiar with uh, Virgins at all. My house is pretty much right there. Sewer treatment facility on the other side of the river, and this is BF Goodrich or whatever it's called now, UTC Aero Systems. Yes. Not that I'm aware of, um, but I don't know if they even did any archaeology. I'm not sure what the status of that was. It is on the other side of the river, uh, but in, obviously in a very historic area. That used to be the site of the old uh, horse nail factory, I believe. So this was a big industrial area even before it was a water treatment facility. Uh, um, we started by uh, sending our illustrious uh, museum founder into the river to see what he could find in water. He spent the better part of about two hours groping his way about along the bottom of Otter Creek trying to see if he bumped into anything. And I can't say he found anything too exciting. Uh, the remains of some rock structures, um, possibly some piers, nothing very earth shattering, but it was fun to, to make him do the dirty work for once. So then we, we shifted our focus to the land side of things. And what we did uh, procedurally here was we set up a long transect along the river. I wanna say this was 500 feet long. And uh, we did a test pit every, uh, every 10 meters along here. And then we did uh, a couple that were offshoots of these when we started to find interesting things in the center of our line here. 
And down at the bottom, you can see kind of the area we were working in. Uh, the long, tra long transect ran along this area. And then we had a couple of spurs coming off of it once we started to think we were getting into the right area. And I should mention this is uh, uh, Joanne Dennis, who was our, our project uh, manager for this whole endeavor. She's, she's our one land archaeologist that we have on staff, so she was able to tell us what to do for a change. It was nice. Um, and in each of these points, we opened a, a one meter uh, square test pit. So this is not a full-fledged excavation. Uh, this is what us archaeology folks would call a phase one excavation. This is just testing. We're just taking samples in a variety of places to see if it tells us where we would focus future excavations. In test pits, you know, you don't expect to find the most amazing things, and we didn't. We found some good stuff, but uh, it was a lot of fill, and especially where the towpath was. They had built up the towpath quite high. So some of our pits were more than a meter deep before you started to get any, even into historic material at all. Um, there had obviously been a lot of land transformation here in the past 200 years, uh, most of which wasn't documented in any way, shape, or form. So we were kind of feeling our way along here. But we went down uh, in 10 centimeter uh, levels, uh, screening everything as it came out, uh, taking extensive notes, of course and uh, sifting through a lot of clay, which is it's not, trying to push clay through a screen is like, uh, like using a cheese grater. You know, you're just kind of shoving it through. It's not very much fun. But it was a, it was a very interesting site to work on, and we exposed a lot of uh, school children and other groups to, uh, to the site as well. Uh, they came and visited, helped out a little bit from time to time, and, uh, and hopefully learned a little something as well. And I should mention that pretty much everyone that worked on the site ended up with a really nasty case of poison ivy. <laughs> we had uh, one of our uh, employees had come in here with a, a DR string trimmer and just cleaned off the whole site, which was great, except now you couldn't tell where the poison ivy was. It was just all these little stems that we were laying on and digging in the holes. And yeah, we all ended up pretty much covered in poison ivy. But <clears throat> that's the tribulations of a land archaeologist. That doesn't happen underwater as much. Um, yeah, some, of these, some of these pits got quite deep. This uh, pit that my colleague Paul here was working in was, was the, uh, this was the money pit. This is the one that turned up the most interesting artifacts and also got to close to two meters deep, which doesn't sound that big, but when you're laying on the ground trying to reach down into it is pretty far. Um, and as you can see, he climbed in there to do, what he's doing there is actually uh, uh, trying to distinguish the layers um, the different soil types in the layers as they go down. And this is what he's got there is called a Munsell chart where you compare soil colors and, and consistencies to determine layers. Yes? Have, have you considered using ground and radar to the first step? Um, I don't think our budget allowed for it, frankly. And none of us here have much experience with it. Uh, I think in the future, if uh, additional examination of this site is warranted, which, which I think it is, uh, that would definitely be a way to go. Um, when Ernie back here and I were talking just a few minutes ago about one of, the, one of the historic reports mentions that at the shipyard they had dug saw pits, you know, where they had these big pits where one guy was down actually in a pit in the ground and the other guy was on top um, of a piece of lumber sawing it. Ground penetrating radar could conceivably pick out those kind of pits and disturbances. So Certainly something to think about for the future. Um, as far as the type of stuff that we found, uh, as you might imagine, we found a huge amount of modern or fairly modern material, uh, ranging from keys, uh, lots of fairly modern pottery. Um, you'll see some of it up here. Some uh, There's a carbon rod from a car battery. There's you know, for all kinds of random stuff. And certainly in the fill areas, this was just all churned up. It was all intermixed with slightly older stuff, um, very disturbed. But, you know, we, we occasionally would bump into a nice square nail um, or some blue transfer wear pottery that, that was suggesting that we were at least, there was some disturbed historic area there somewhere. Uh, so we kept going deeper and deeper. Um, 
the whole site was just littered with coal and clinker, um, which is just basically the residue of burned coal. So there was uh, probably a lot of smithing going on in this area, um, a lot of coal burning in general. You know, a lot of steamships traveled up and down this area too. Uh, so there was a lot, of, a lot of coal being used. I think coal fragments and clinker amounted to about 40% of the collection. So there was a, a lot of pieces. Um, some of the more interesting things were this, uh, a whole pile of these, these type of bricks with the hollow tubes inside which were probably used in the construction of an ice house. Um, that air chamber in the middle of the brick adding a, a, an additional layer of insulation um, for a structure built out of this material. You can see some of those after the presentation up on the table as well. Once we got down uh, certainly at least a meter to a meter and a half below the, uh, the, the present surface, we really started to get into some interesting and contemporaneous material to the shipyard. Um, a number of, uh, again, pieces of blue transfer ware that really dates to the, from the 1790s to the 1820s, give or take. So that's, you know, 1812, 1814, it's falling right in the middle of that. Then you've got what's commonly referred to as shell edge or feather edge pottery, this, this version being green. Um, this is, to me, this says War of 1812. We find lots of green and blue uh, shell edge or feather edge pottery on War of 1812 sites. The, we have a large collection of artifacts from Plattsburgh Bay itself uh, that were collected by a, a diver over the course of about 20 years and he, he donated his whole collection to us. But it is just rife with uh, this type of pottery. So we were definitely getting into a, a layer that was, um, you know, certainly the right time. Um, this was probably the most exciting thing that we found, and I know it doesn't look like much, but it's a really nice kaolin pipe. And this uh, type of decoration on the bowl here with the bands and the beads, it's pre-1815, give or take. So that's, you know, that's a really good indicator that we were at least at the right level. I don't think I have a picture of it, but we also found a, a nice musket ball. Uh, it's up here on the table. Um, so we could tell that we were in... You know, we were at a place, <laughs> a level where folks around the War of 1812 were living. Uh, there's a number of other pipe stems. There's a, a tremendous amount of animal bone, uh, mostly beef and pork bones that were found in this, at this level. So either we were on the shipyard, we were near the shipyard, we were where the people who worked at the shipyard were camping and staying. We were in the right area. The problem is we did not find that ship construction tool that we had hoped for. We didn't find that caulking iron or you know, anything that said, yes, these were shipbuilding going on right here. But that's what testing's for. We got down to the right level uh, and we think we're in at least the right area. So hopefully that will lead to some further investigations in the future, but that's really gonna be up to uh, mostly to funding, um, probably from the uh, American Battlefield Protection folks again. Um, if you're at all interested in doing more research on this topic, um, you can't do better than Dudley's War of 1812, the documentary history. It's an extremely extensive uh, collection of letters and documentation from the War of 1812. And a little plug for myself here, Kevin Christman's Coffins of the Brave is a forthcoming publication that has chapters by myself and others relating to shipwrecks and naval warfare uh, during the War of 1812. Any questions I can answer for you guys? Yes. That's a good question. Um, this gentleman is wondering if any of the vessels, you know, naval vessels were, were thought of as being converted to merchant ships. Um, I don't believe there was. You know, first of all, there was, there was no uh, definite answer that this was going to be a lasting piece at the time. And as they were built out of very green timber, even a couple years later, they were probably not worth saving. I don't think any uh, right-minded merchant would have invested his money in them. <laughs> they followed the history of the linen, uh, yeah. a few of the other vessels, and they were put up for sale, and they were not purchased. 
No, nobody was interested, yeah. There, there are accounts of the Confiance as it's sailing into battle. There are people complaining about how the, the, the deck is cupping so much as the, the wood dries that they can't run the guns in and out easily because it's like... Whoop, whoop, whoop. So, uh, fast and furious. They were making these things quick. Yes, sir. What was the timber of choice for building these vessels? What was the timber of choice for shipbuilding? Um, typically, you wanted white oak for the structural timbers, you know, for the... Uh, for the, the, the keel and stem and stern posts and the framing. And often it was just pine that was used for planking. I mean, if you could have enough oak to do the planking as well, that would be great. When we started doing wood typology on the shipwrecks um, that were found in the Pulteney River, you know, those were the most common materials. But you found all kinds of weird things that are not typically considered good shipbuilding timbers that were just kind of used as a filler piece here, or as a frame. We didn't have a piece of oak that was the right shape, so we'll use this piece of hemlock or whatever we had. So that's great evidence to the speed uh, and uh, rushed nature of these, these ship construction projects. Anybody else? Okay, great. As I mentioned, there are a number of things laid out here on the table that uh, you're welcome to come up and take a look at. Please obviously be, be gentle with them. Thank you very much. About test pits. Yeah. Like I said, the one pit was really kind of the. Some plastic come out. Yeah. Well.